this episode of Scholar Talks, the guiding question is what role do emotions play in presidential campaigns and elections? Our guest is Heather Yates, a professor of political science at the University of Central Arkansas and the author of several books, including The Politics of Emotions, Candidates, and Choices, as well as The Politics of Spectacle and Emotions in the 2016 Presidential Campaign. I am Tony Williams, Senior Fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and I am pleased to bring you another episode in the American Government and Civics series. I want to thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure, Tony. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I mean, I'm so fascinated by your books uh, for a couple of reasons. One is you have just such interesting case studies from recent elections, which are just so so interesting. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to those. But the other thing, you, know, you really challenged me to think. And that's sort of the point of uh, of learning, right? And and reading new books is that, you know, you challenged me to, to rethink perhaps the, the positive role that emotions can play in presidential campaigns and elections. So, uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to have you on. Thank you. I'm glad to be here to talk about this subject. Right. Well, let's jump right in. Kind of a big question. Um, there's so much I want to talk about. So, so what role do emotions play in presidential campaigns and elections? And how can emotions complement uh, the, the traditional idea of the irrational informed voter? I love this question because a lot of the motivation behind me taking on this research was to address that presupposition people have about emotions and politics that they are negative and that anytime you're being emotional, you're being irrational. And I wanted to challenge that thinking a little bit to demonstrate that there is a connection between thinking and feeling. There's a connection between feeling and thinking. And so emotions have a great deal of, of influence over everyday decision making, not just political decision making, but I apply that to the political context. And so a lot of the research that I pull from comes from social psychology. And the social psychology research demonstrates through their methodology of basically uh, controlled uh, experiments was that thinking and feeling are connected, but what's fascinating about human emotions is that they precede judgment, they precede thinking. So oftentimes voters or just citizens know how they feel about something before they can actually articulate the reasoning behind how they feel that. And I think it's also important to note that it's just how our brains are wired to function, to keep us alive and healthy in social situations. Um, our brains are constantly assessing our environments for threats. They're uh, constantly making judgments of is it a safe environment, is it a dangerous environment? And our brains don't really make that connection that we're in different environments when we're talking about the marketplace of politics and the political campaigns. And so our emotions do a great deal and give us a lot of servicing to help our judgment by helping us signal what's a threat, what's a foe, what's a friend, um, what is something that's going to harm us, or what is something we need to pay attention to. So we're constantly surveying that environment. Okay, great. So, so why are campaigns and elections seemingly, at least, becoming a lot more emotional? And and do campaigns themselves appeal to the emotions or or play on them? And finally. Uh, if it's not too much, you know, what role does the media and especially social media today play in evoking these emotions? Sure. Yeah, I, I will take the media question and kind of infuse that with my my answer about um, why does it seem like campaigns are becoming more emotional? Because it really does seem like once upon a time, some of us can remember maybe an era in which it didn't seem as emotional as it is. Um, but I really like to pause for a second and discuss campaigns of the 19th century, right? You know, there was a lot of emotive campaigning um, in the era before modern technology. And the, the fascinating, compelling factoid about historical campaigns is a lot of times they were sources of community entertainment. It'd be a Sunday afternoon, a candidate would show up at the churchyard. Um, it was not illegal to give your potential voters, um, booze, alcohol, cider, you know, they called it cider, cider campaigning, right? You know, and, and so it just sounded like a wild time in which it'd be a family affair and you show up and you listen to a candidate bash the opposition. And because it was in, it was a source of entertainment. It was also, um, played out in the press. It's a different medium than what we have now. I think 
why a lot of political watchers might assess campaigns becoming more emotional, I think it has a couple of things to do with one, political polarization. There's been a slow moving partisan partic uh, polarization happening really since I think we can point to 1994. And so um, that evolves into then campaigns being kind of a team sport. Are you team red? Are you team blue? And then we that evolves into what we now have um, on the, the platform that we talk about negative partisanship, right? It's not necessarily being negative, but it's despising the opposition so much that it consolidates and galvanizes your loyalty to your current partisan affiliation. And then that gets played out among our social networks, online, on digital platforms. And so it creates an echo chamber effect. And so that amplifies and intensifies, coupled by the evolution of the information industry, the news media, the broadcast news media, too. I, I, I don't go into this in, in great detail in my books because there's a plethora of scholars who study just this. But I think it is necessary to discuss that just the information for profit industry, you know, so the news industry has moved from information as public service to information for profit. And what is going to compel people to act? Emotive cues. Um, and so we know a lot of thing, basic things about emotions and how they work within our cognition. And something that I will mention is that certain emotions provide more external motivation than others. And that's usually negative emotions are externalizing. And so if you can cue up negative emotions in your viewing audience, that is gonna compel them to one, pay attention, a little bit more. Um, if you're online, it drives clicks on stories. Um, salacious headlines draw clicks. Um, and I really think it's a conflation and it's a combination of all of these factors mixing together to kind of create the current landscape in which we are navigating now, which seems like it's a little bit more emotional because we are more focused on emotional cues, personalities, personality traits, the personalization of our politics, and maybe less on deliberating what economic policies really mean for us, what pocketbook issues really mean for us, um, the prices at the grocery store, what that really means for us. So we're not really deliberating that in the same way that we probably did three or four decades ago. All right. And so then as a follow-up, are, are campaigns purposefully packaging their candidates like that to be more candidate-focused rather than sort of you know, sort of issue driven or, or um, sort of more rational side of things. I'm glad you asked that question, Tony, because I, I do want to talk about um, how the evolution of the candidate centered campaign is also contributing to this, right? Because prior to um, loosely, prior to the 1960s, it was more party driven. Um, so people were self referencing their politics in terms of do they identify as Democrat or Republican? And now, um, with the evolution of the hyper intensive focus on just the candidate as the standard bearer leading leader of the ticket and becoming the standard bearer of the party per se, the symbolic leader of the party, um, voters are now referencing themselves um, or, or positioning themselves spatially in their headspace to which you know camp base that they fall into, who do they support more to the point that they even self reference as being a fan instead of a supporter of a particular candidate. And that is very telling, right? So I think the slow evolution of candidate-centered campaigns really amplified by the hyper-focus that the broadcast media now also places on um, the, the candidates' personalities, their personal traits, their looks, scandals. And also I should probably loop in like digital press is now followed suit into that. So I absolutely um, fully believe that that plays a fact too. To, to answer the ultimate question, do candidates purposefully use this as a strategy? Absolutely. Candidate rhetoric, there's a lot of good um, research on the uses of um, candidate rhetoric and how emotive they are. And it's not just candidate rhetoric too. There's a lot of research being done on members of Congress and House and Senate floor speeches are also using a lot of emotive laden language, meaning what? It's a lot of value judgment, value laden language being used to evoke very specific reactions from those who are um, viewing the footage. And most of it leans to the negative because what do we know psychologically about negative emotions? They are more externalizing. They are more likely to produce action. They're more likely, honestly, to emotions are to function like motivated reasoning. And so, yeah, so candidates and, and, and office holders are going to use 
negative language, um, emphatic language, and and inflammatory language to get to that that motivation um, to get somebody really mad because they're going to pay attention more rather than if they're coming back, coming away from that feeling really happy, settled, proud. Um, yeah. So it also has to do with the attention span of our viewing audience as well. Negative emotions keep people glued to the TV screen. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, so much for morning in America. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're, we're still, we're still waiting, hopeful for that. <laughs> Right, right, right. Very good. All right. Well, well, let's take around with some of those great case studies from your book. So, uh, in your books, um, in in two thousand four, the strongest feelings seem to be associated with national security issues, doing the war on terror, the war in Afghanistan, and then the 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 newly waged war in Iraq. So, can you tell us a little bit about two thousand four? Yeah, two thousand four was really a fascinating case study for the reason that it was the first presidential election after 9-11. Um, it is the first time that the United States electorate is weighing in on George W. Bush is now a wartime president. And there was a two front war in Iraq and Afghanistan. But what was fascinating about that election was that the uh, Bush campaign um, really tried to de-emphasize those two wars or that two front war and focus more on domestic issues. But what's compelling in the data is that it had mixed results, is that all of the domestic issues that were coupled really with what we call um, the, the culture war or morality politics, while they were maybe overemphasized, um, voters really had Iraq and Afghanistan on their mind. And in the 2004 case study, there was only four emotional dimensions tested, and that was two negative, so that was anger and fear, and then two positive, and that was hope and pride. And what we see with George W. Bush is, and how I tested this, is that I was looking for something called basically candidate affect response, which essentially means it's how do voters or how did the respondents to the survey, how did they feel about George W. Bush? And did those feelings about George W. Bush, did they like him, hate him? How did it make him feel emotionally? Then did those feelings get projected onto campaign issues? And they did. And so that's what I'm finding is that voters are taking their cues from their cam their candidate um, or the candidates in the, the campaigns. And then they project those assessments and those judgments of the candidate onto their issues. And so what I found is that um, anger and fear were predominant emotions playing out in voters' minds. And that was anger and fear towards George W. Bush on the specific question of Iraq and Afghanistan. And how that question was asked is, is that military engagement worth the cost? However, the respondent interpreted cost. Was it a human cost, economic cost? That was open to interpretation. But what we see is that it is overwhelmingly negative. There's one more thing that I want to point out about how negative emotions were playing out in political landscapes. And this is pretty much true across all the years and all the cycles that I, I studied, was that negative emotions tend to correlate with retrospective voting and positive aspirational emotions correlated with prospective voting, which would make sense because anytime somebody's looking forward, they're trying to be aspirational. Um, but yeah, so on the military, domestic security and international security questions, there was um, two, two emotions that played out very significantly. Um, and that was fear and anger. And mostly a, a lot of it was also fear. Fear type, type tends to edge anger out a little bit. But these are two different emotions in terms of how they psychologically get activated and the type of um, behavior and cognition that they motivate. But yeah, and so in 2004, that was really what was compelling is that the actual campaign narrative coming out of the Bush camp was domestic issues, social issues, morality issues, um, but that doesn't really register as profoundly in the data, in the survey data. So I thought that was really fascinating. Right. Yes, for, for sure. Um, so, uh, and that tees up uh, prospective, uh, retrospective, uh, tees up, I think, uh, 2008 really well. So in 2008, historic election in a lot of ways, uh, what were some of the strongest emotions evoked during the campaign? I mean, we have the financial crisis, certainly race, gender, several important issues. So in 2008, once again, an, another compelling case study right after 2004, we do have um, a, 
on both tickets, Republican and Democrat, very historic nominations. Democrats nominate Barack Obama and Republicans um, with McCain nominate um, Sarah Palin as the VP candidate. So very historic watershed moment. And what's really compelling about 2008 is that Barack Obama, as the Democratic nominee at that point in time, had been the first presidential candidate, really, I'm going to say since 1932, who campaigned solely on positive emotional dimensions in the wake of financial disaster. So something that is very um, <laughs> scary to a lot of Americans, infusing a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity, and so therefore anxiety is going to be high, although that's not one of the emotional dimensions that were tested in 2008. But what we see is fascinating. We see some things from 2004 hold. We do see negative emotions correlate with retrospective um, assessments. And so voters were assessing the incumbent party, the Republican party in very negative ways. And then that just amplified at the end of September of 2008 because the particular survey data that I was using um, all had been collected mostly before that market crash in the late, late election cycle. So even that variable not being accounted for, there is still an overwhelmingly negative perspective of the George W. Bush campaign and the incumbent Republican Party. Now, across all of my models that I tested, across all the issues that I tested, uh, which are always going to be in international, military, domestic, security, and then social, hope, hope registers for Barack Obama. And so this is a direct thread from his narrative, his campaigning so fiercely on hope and change absolutely is reflected back in the survey data. And so while we see um, mostly anger register for the incumbent party, we really see statistically significant measures across all my models that Barack Obama's messaging was very effective and it was very positive and it was that hope, so it's aspirational. And will we know that Barack Obama ultimately wins the presidency in 2008? So um, case holds that aspirational feelings looking forward correlate with prospective voting in that case. All right, good. Uh, and contrarily, let's get to the 2016 election. Um, so obviously that evoked a lot of very strong emotion and a campaign that might be characterized, I think, uh, in the in one of the books as democrazy, uh, a sort of political spectacle, right, uh, with populism, immigration, economic nationalism, a lot of sort of very emotional or very personal issues um, being played out, especially on social media with, with sort of the rise of Twitter and so forth. So uh, do you want to speak about 2016? 2016 is once again another compelling case. Like we have so like sandwiched together, every single one of these election cycles is offering something of a watershed moment. And 2016 is no no stranger to that. Um, so we have, once again, another historic nomination on the Democratic side with its first woman at, to head a major party ticket. And then we have a political outsider coming right in with Donald Trump. And um, at first, you know, uh, everybody thought that he was a long shot in the primary, but he, he cinches that nomination. Here we are teed up for, once again, a very compelling, just historic election. Not to mention now we have a little bit of, of political theater happening. Because Donald Trump, no stranger to television, no stranger to the in, being entertainment, he knew how to entertain. And so he knew how to bring in political theater and execute it flawlessly. And then he also knew how to really engage the populist presidency. And he did with Twitter what I think FDR probably did with radio. And so he showed the political arena how to take a, a relatively new-ish digital platform and use it to pretty much run a campaign. And he did not run a conventional campaign, Clinton did. He showed that he could practically campaign via Twitter and it energizes a lot of party organizations at the state level in a way that no other candidate had. So we had, what does that mean? That means people who had never been engaged in politics or paying attention to politics were all of a sudden paying attention to politics because the spectacle, it becomes a source of entertainment, like, like our favorite campaigns from our 19th century examples, right? It becomes a source of entertainment. It becomes something people are paying attention to. So their senses are heightened out of just intrigue. 
And um, then what was fascinating with the survey data here was that the negative type of emotions that Hillary Clinton evoked, a lot of respondents saw Hillary Clinton in very negative light. They were, they were afraid. Fear registers in statistically significant ways um, for Hillary Clinton, whereas the positive dimensions, the aspirational dimensions of hope registered for Donald Trump in 2016. So that was really fascinating. So that was telling us that voters did not see any kind of perceived threat from Donald Trump. They did see this perceived threat from Hillary Clinton. Now, that's not in a vacuum, right? There's at least three decades of Hillary Clinton ha having a, a reputation that preceded her, and that plays out. Um, so that was what was really, really fascinating. And why it's fascinating, because we talked a little bit about media. And we, we know, um, those of us who watched that election, went through that election and watched it closely, know that even during the Republican primary, how intensely focused print media and broadcast media and digital media were on Donald Trump for being that dark horse candidate, that outsider, that kind of renegade, um, the anti-establishment candidate, everything that um, a lot of Americans at the time, that was resonating with them. Um, and so Hillary Clinton represented establishment Donald Trump represented anything outside of establishment. And so what was really, really fascinating is even though there was a lot of negative framing of Donald Trump, and even in some cases, negative priming, depending on which outlet we're going to talk about, right? So inviting their viewers to already negatively judge Donald Trump. It does not really resonate in the survey data, which is really compelling. So so sometimes I think broadcast media might like to think that they, they do you know, pull some some strings on where public opinion goes. Um, in 2016, there was very favorable feelings towards Donald Trump, and that got projected onto a lot of policies that he floated in that election cycle. What fascinating! Um, so uh, today, um, we are in the middle of another very emotional campaign. Uh, so, what do emotional campaigns and elections mean for the health of politics, for civil society? even just for conversation and how we're relating to each other in the country, because you know, it seems to me that it's having somewhat of a, of a negative effect. Um, but I'll, I'll turn the question over to you. So this is where I, I get to parse out that emotions, the role emotions have in our political cognition um, play has a very functional role, a role of utilitarianism, if we will, that we, do not make judgments without our emotional side. However, at the aggregate level, right, when we are coming together as a society in our civil discourse, we are seeing some of the negative trends coming from populism and the emotive aspects that populism brings. Some of the liabilities are manifesting. And there's two that I can think of. Um, one, um, less civil discourse. People are just less civil. Um, less civil because of how they are self-referencing politically. Are they referencing as Team R, Team D? Are they referencing as Team Trump, Team Harris? And therefore, there's this existential rejection of opposition, and there's no um, attempt to try to understand somebody's viewpoint different than their own. So that then is parlayed into the second observation that I make, is that the highly emotive political landscape with uh, both candidates, office holders, and supporters all using and adopting very inflammatory language, it is making us less deliberative as a civic society and as our representative institutions. There is very little deliberation. Um, and I know I'm, I'm painting a broad brush in, in, in the interest of time, but these are, these are the two observations that I have in terms of the liabilities of when emotions are not mediated, that language is not mediated. And, and when I say language, I mean rhetoric and that words do matter and words do have consequences. And those are the two observations that I'm seeing where we're at right now. Um, to offer just a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of hope, what I am, what I am seeing those with this election cycle in 2024, which has been, once again, we just keep amping up the intensity with every election cycle, that every election cycle tends to be more historic than the one previous and more historic unusual things are happening and this particular one is is no, no different than that i mean we've had a very very unusual election cycle to where i think it's with a lot of violence and i think it's capturing 
attention to where it's like maybe maybe we need to pay attention to some of the consequences and negative rhetoric and pull that back and how i'm seeing that manifest is that there is a a, a small attempt at talking more about policy rather than just running down the opposition but yet again every time i get hope you know the weekend cycle comes through and then somebody has said something to denigrate their opposition so um yeah every monday we start at square one i guess okay well here, here's hope with that that emotion can be a very productive complement to the rational informed voter as we deliberate together as, mm -hmm. as Americans. So let, let's all uh, maybe have a vote for that. Yes, ab <laughs> so, absolutely. Well said. Well said. Great. Okay. Well, well, Heather, you, thank you so much for joining us to discuss this important topic. Very timely, very important. Uh, and thank you all for joining us on this episode of Scholar Talks. Please check out the other interviews in our topics in American government and civic series on our channel. Thanks.